techniques, threats, trends, and emerging technologies to deliver a platform that fuels success today and opportunity tomorrow. Together with you, the community, we are not just reacting to the world as it is, we are preparing for the world as it will be. Welcome to Swamp Up 2023. Let's get ready for next. And now, let's get ready for next with the man who is sparked by what tomorrow brings. He's here to bring you a Swamp Up Wake Up as we look at the next leaps forward in DevOps and DevSecOps. A warm welcome, please, for JFrog CEO and co-founder, Shlomi Banhai. Anytime you prepare with what you want to start with, you always start with something else. But I'll tell you one thing. There are three things that make a conference better, and three things that make a conference something to remember and to learn from. A, the content. And I'm telling you right here, right now, what the frogs have prepared for you will make Swamp Up a game changer in the world of DevOps and DevSecOps. And I would love to hear your feedback afterward. But we worked very hard to bring the content that is not only aligned with our strategy, but also with what you need. The second thing you need in order to make a very good conference is obviously the people who build it. And we have a team of 100 people from JFOG that worked in the past six months to make it perfectly aligned with real expectation. This is, this is not yet another event. We want it to be a community event. We want it to be something that you can bring, not just from JFOG back home, but also from the community back home. And the last thing is obviously the energy in the room. So I would ask you to stand up for a moment. Stand up, stand up. 9 a.m. I need to wake you up. Stand up, everyone, and give a big round of applause to you for making it to San Jose at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Thank you. I've been to other conferences that uh, the speaker made us jump and speak, and uh, I'm, I'm just asking you to stand up. <laughs> Let's speak about what's coming next. Are you ready for next? Yeah! Are you ready for next? Our sponsors and partners outside are the ones that build the, the market with us, are the ones that support us, are the ones that pave the way each year to build a better DevOps and a better DevSecOps world. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. If you are ready for next, I want to share with you what comes next. But in order to leap forward, I have to look back. And in 2018, we spoke about liquid software for the first time. I remember this vision comes from Fred my co-founders, and then Fred and you have wrote the book, and we brought the, the actor that played Richard in the Silicon Valley HBO show, and we make some jokes on the Swamp Up stage. Do you guys remember that? Someone was with us in Swamp Up uh, 2018. And Richard, oh, the, <laughs> Richard, the, the uh, uh, character name, and we made some jokes out of it. Will someone in this room today doubt how important continuous update is as a vision, as a mission? This is what we do. This is what we wake up for. This is our breakfast and this is our dinner. Why are we automating everything? Why are we securing everything? In order to have a world where software is liquid. And hereafter, we spoke about security. And then, 
We said to you, security is going to be yet another task on your plate. And you will have to support the people in your organization. As you provide them with DevOps services, you will also have to make sure that these two walls are harmonized and bridged. So you will have one solution that is not only fast, but also secure. Raise your hand if you think otherwise today, four years after, if you think that security is not part of your job. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I took a bet here. <laughs> and it's not over. Like, uh, look at us. We, we met just a year ago and we spoke about security and how the world is going to the edge and th that's wonderful. But something happened in November of last year with uh, ChatGPT and everything around AI and everybody's speaking about AI and we will speak about it today. A bit different than what you hear from the market, a bit less uh, um, focusing on the, on the slogans, but the practicality. But it's not only us anymore that deals with fast and secured continuous update world. It's not only us, it's also machines that are now part of it. And let me tell you one thing, and, uh, and this is different than what I remember 10 years ago. What I remember 10 years ago as DevOps started, or a bit more, I remember speaking about automation, acceleration of software, acceleration of processes. We spoke about continuous integration, right, Koska? Guys, Koske Kawakuchi, the founder of Jenkins. We spoke about automation, but we spoke about automation because machine-powered developers. And AI is a bit different, because machine now can take some tasks by themselves and can train themselves to even do it better than us. So we are talking not only about the world of software, of liquid software, we are talking about the world of liquid software where everything is fast, secure, automated, but also being done by a new player that is a machine. And we will speak about that today uh, and, and what has been changed. Now, in order to implement that, we, we have to set some strategy and we have to follow the j philosophy. So one of the things that uh, we identified was the change in the market. So what happened in the 80s and the 90s, and most of you are too young to probably remember that, but big giant companies provided you as a developer with a platform. And it was a platform in a box, and this is what you do, this is what you work with. And then the era of open source, the era of best of breed, this is where j was born. j was born to this, to this pain, to best of breed, to open source, to developers' freedom, to the democracy of developers. And what do we have now? What do we see now? We see you asking us to consolidate it around some expertise so it will not get out of proportion when you provide your organization with a tool set. How many tools can one developer manage? And how scalable it is? And how secure it is? And how expensive it is? So we start to see a kind of a movement from a full platform to a full best of breed, to a platform with a best of breed experience. Consolidating tools around expertise. Not so long ago, when we went public in 2020, we spoke about a hybrid world. And we got some legit questions. Like, do you really think that the world is going to stay hybrid? Because we hear that everybody is moving to the cloud. I'll tell you one thing. First of all, maybe. But you are telling us that it's still important for you to keep the freedom of choice. And you know what, Shlomi? Our storage volume is at the level that we cannot allow ourselves to move all the assets to the cloud. And you know what? We are a highly regulated company, so it will take us time to move some workloads to the cloud. 
And you know what? Even if we will move to the cloud, we don't want to be one cloud shop. We don't want to have any vendor lock-in. We want to have the freedom of choice, the flexibility. That there is nothing wrong about that. To demand that, there's nothing wrong about it. And when we spoke about it in 2020, it was, what do you mean? You're not moving to the cloud? Not everything is moving to the cloud? To the cloud? Yes. The majority of our customers set it as, as part of the strategy to move DevOps and DevSecOps more close to the cloud. And we gain amazing experience together with them doing so. But it's a transition mode and it will take time. And until then, the world still needs a hybrid environment. And the last thing is obviously the binaries. If I would stand on this stage 10 years ago and ask you what is the primary asset that you manage when you run your software supply chain, your answer would probably be 90%, 80% of, of my time is about source code management from the different groups in my organization and different uh, uh, projects and different contributions and commits and so on. And if I will ask you today, what is the 70, 80% of your software supply chain? What is the primary asset? What is it that you bring from outside from the public hub? What is it that you secure? What is it that you tag, that you promote, that you distribute? What do you have in your runtime environment, if not binary? And by the way, with this new guest that called a machine that doesn't speak English, it's all about binaries. What is an AI model and a training model if not a binary? So from one year to another, we start to see how important it is to be focused on an asset and not just to build a platform with crazy capabilities, but to build a platform with the right capabilities, focusing on the right asset and to build your expertise around that. And then what will happen is that we will have different platforms that provide the best of breed experience because of this expertise around an asset that coexists. Now, 50% of you sit in the crowd and love me and a big fan of the frogs and say, wow, he's right. And the other 50% is my challenge. The other 50% I'm saying, okay, so he took his strategy and his philosophy and made it a fact on stage. So, we prepared ourselves to this 50% and we bought what the market is saying. Guys, look at JFOG, 14 years after we founded the company. And what you will see here today is all about innovation and alignment with what you need tomorrow. And when we ask you, are you ready for next? We are serious about it. But we know that because we are very good listeners. And we never failed. We didn't miss the, the cloud or the containers revolution, the Kubernetes. All of these changes, we didn't miss that. Because we are a good listener. So here's what the market is saying about platform versus best of breed. What the market is saying about platform versus best of breed is that your manager, the CIOs, the CISOs, your leaders, the people who manage your organization and sign the check, are saying, yes, would like to see some consolidation. You know why? Because 20 tools per developers is not cool anymore. It's out of proportion. It's not managed, manageable. Yes, we want to see some kind of an organization around an asset that, that we lead. And when we ask them about security and DevOps, security is if not number one, number two in the list. And why is that? Why is that? All the companies that we met, all the companies, 100%, no matter what your size is, no matter how young you are, no matter how big you are, no matter what language you use, no matter where you are in the world, all companies have some security tools. Raise your hand if you have more than one. Come on, don't be shy. That's, that's it. That's, that's it. Raise your hand if you have more than five. Yes. So what, what has been changed? I'll tell you what happened. 
What happens is that you are in a race with the hacker that is not sitting within your organization and looking at your static analysis and how you protect your source code. This guy is waiting for you at the production environment, in the runtime environment, and guess what you have there? Oh, yes, binaries. And this is how Log4j happened. And this is what Spring Shell is telling you. And this is the NPM story. This is the PyPI story. These are the vulnerabilities that the White House referred in the bill that they sent to all of us in how you protect your software supply chain. So yes, DevOps and security are one, but yes, security must be modernized. And when we ask your CIOs, not me, all the, this fancy bank, some of them are, are sitting here, uh, we just quoted from the CIO survey, what we asked about hybrid and multi-cloud was shocking. Like it's changing so fast. We asked him, so what do you think about hybrid? And the majority of, of the people said, we prefer a mixture. And maybe it's not something that you say on stage, but that's the reality. Is there anyone here that will say it's only self-managed or on-prem or only cloud? Of course not. But more than that, all of the big enterprises that are working with JFrog are demanding now from day one to put a five years or even more strategy about how you build a multi-cloud, a multi-region solution that is also a hybrid solution. And it's mandatory to provide a tool that is identical wherever you use it. And obviously, <laughs> we have to speak about that. Um, so first, I check the box. Second, nobody really know what it means. And if, if, if someone is telling you, if someone is telling you, and I know that we have some crazy um, talks about it today, Eli, I know that you're going to speak about AI and how Google implements that, but we don't really know. We don't really know what these machines are preparing for us. But I do know one thing. It must be better controlled, and it must be regulated, and it must be secured. Because what our customers, and put aside the surveys, put aside the surveys, of course everybody is speaking about that. Of course everybody already allocated budget to kind of implement Gen AI in, in his organization, her organization. But put this aside and think about, think about what's happening now. And what our customers are telling us is that they are freaking out because they don't know if their developers are using AI. Do you know if your developers are using Copilot now? Do you know if they use other tools? My daughter, my, my 15 years old daughter doing homework with ChatGPT. Of course, it's being used. It's being used and what we have to make sure as the providers of this service, because these guys will come to you, the Python developers, the data scientists, they will come to you to get these services. <coughs> and what we have to make sure is that we provide them the best environment we can. And this, what makes me think and state that the flow of software supply chain is a flow of binary, because there is one thing that is relevant to all of the things that I mentioned, to all of the things that the CIO survey said. And I know that because you told us so. Yes, there is a lot that comes from the frog brain and vision, but a lot more that comes from, from the community. And you will hear more from these guys on stage today Swamp Up is not just about what JFrog have to say to the world. Swamp Up is a collection of community leaders and speakers that took the time in order to come over and share best practices with you. Thank you. Thank you. And the best speaker 
Like every year, in the past two years, the best speaker that you will vote for will be recognized with the Carl Quinn Award. One of our biggest fans, someone who crafted what you call today DevOps and DevSecOps, a great leader, a great open source leader, someone who I personally miss a lot, and his advice and his ideas, and him on stage, and a lot of you know, is someone that we miss, and every year we will keep recognizing um, as the one that can point us to the best speaker. Tracy Quinn, Carl's wife, thank you for joining us every year. It means a lot to me. Thank you. May the frog be with you guys. And now, with no further ado, I would like to call our CTO and co-founder, Joab Landman, to the stage. It's a vessel for innovation, an artist of software whose canvas extends beyond DevOps. Please welcome JFrog CTO, Joab Landman. When things start to be very boring, Joab, Fred, and myself are working together for 22 years. Last week I, I celebrated with my wife our 23rd anniversary. I'm a bit confused with whom I'm wasting more time, uh, of, well, precious time of my life. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking here about a few things and some of it might even sound a conflict when it comes from a frog mouth. Um, you created Artifactory. You built Artifactory as an open source project long time ago. You were very young back then. And, and it was kind of a best of breed solution. And in the past four years, five years, what I hear from you and what I see is that you are obsessed about the platform. So are you converting or something has changed? Or what, what's the reason of that? Yeah, so when I created Artifactory, it was to solve the pain. The pain of managing binaries. But like you said, binaries, they are the ones that are making the full software supply chain. So this pain expanded, and we want to provide a single pane of view for everything along your, your software supply chain. So this is why I'm pushing so much for, for a platform view. To serve more, more persona. And I get that, and now, you know, just between you and I. <laughs> a platform? Can you really have a best of breed experience with a platform? Or is it more like an enterprise play now? You, I, I believe you can win on both fronts if you keep the approach of opening everything, opening up the APIs, keeping, uh, we, you know, we, we you spoke, you, uh, I think uh, uh, coin this phrase, to integrate it to fail. This is our philosophy. Everything we do, we open up. You can also always integrate, bring on your own tools. They may compete, they may complete, but that's the JFO philosophy. Well, you will have now to protect what you just said. Everyone, please welcome Joab Landman, our CTO. Okay, so we're here to speak about software supply chain. And before we do, let's, let's speak about the experience with your own developers today. So your developers today, they need to do much more than just coding. Uh, the authority, the, the sense of uh, responsibility, just keeps increasing to manage the application end to end. So there will be coding, of course. There will be testing and packaging and figuring out how to create a release and bundle it and how to configure all the deployment parameters. And in many organizations also take it the full way to production, maybe configuring the helm charts and so on. And monitoring and uh, responding to uh, what's going on in production. So there's a lot uh, on, on the uh, plate. And we're actually seeing even the largest JFO customers moving to this approach because it just increases productivity so much. But there is a gap. And this gap is the gap between developers and operations. Your developers, they may know a lot of stuff, but they need the operations 
in order to make them more productive. In, in, basically in order to make them better operators of their software. This is a Gartner slide uh, of prediction that speaks about a new concept, well, seemingly new, because I'm pretty much sure that for many of you, this is just a, a name, plat platform engineering, uh, which means that you're providing your developers with all the infrastructure and all the services that they need in order to become productive. So, many of you in the audience, I'm sure you've been doing it from day one. This is your day job. Maybe you've created these platform engineering uh, uh, machines in multi multiple companies uh, as you move uh, between them. And software supply chain is the, I think it's the most critical, it's critical if not the most critical part of software supply chain because it's all about your target, it's all about creating the release. And the Jeffrey platform that many of you rely on is about helping you making a release faster and making uh, releases that are more trusted and have more quality in them. And today I'm going to cover many, many very exciting announcements around how we expand the Jeffrey platform, what the new features that we introduce in order to allow your developers to be more productive, to create more trusted releases. And these announcements are going to be around three main areas. So, DevOps, uh, next is security or DevSecOps, and finally, like the mandatory MLOps, but it's not just mandatory for, for the hype. You'll see that it's very, very relevant, and it's going to become very relevant from, for anyone. But let's start with DevOps. So before we go to, to the next, let's visit the, the, few, the, the past a little bit. And uh, I think this picture is not going to be too surprising to many of you. Like, uh, you're creating a pipeline in order to create your software. And this pipeline is comprised of multiple components that are all about automation. The first uh, JFOG slogan was release fast or die, so it was about speed, about getting there to the market as quickly as possible. And you have those Enablers like infrastructure as code automation and automated testing and automated builds and then you do it continuously so you have CI and CD and you connect all those um, islands of automation together uh, in order to create a pipeline. But there are many challenges with this approach. Like uh, how do you know what components got into your pipeline? How do you know if they are uh, safe to use? How do you know what's running well? And how do you know uh, if what you're building and what you're testing and what you're deploying is the same release. And finally, how do you even think about picking up the components that you're going to uh, use in your software? So we need something a little bit better. We need to instill trust. And when you think about this pipeline, the pipeline is very nice. Everyone knows that we need, we need a pipeline. But at the end of the day, we have one thing in mind, which is the software release. So that's the JFOG approach about thinking about software, watching you, trying to protect the release, trying to instill more trust into it and make the, the, make the release with the highest quality possible. That, that's what you think about. The pipeline is a vehicle. Um, everyone knows it's automated, it's uh, cyclic and, and everything, but that's the end in mind. And when you think about the release first uh, approach, you need to uh, kind of inject points of control in order to make sure that your quality of the quality of the release is there. And this gives you the trust. Uh, and you want to control things like security, licensing, uh, compliance with the process that you expect it to follow when you create a software release, uh, and of course quality in general. And that's not a conclusive list. You may have other things that you need to guarantee when you create your software release in your uh, own organization. So, it's not new, right? We, we can compare it to traditional industry. This is the software supply chain, or supply chain, not software, of uh, soft drinks. So this is really how uh, the pipeline of, uh, of Coca-Cola looks like. You have a process. You start with raw water on the left, and then there are all kind of different processes that I'm not going to go into details, uh, but you have checkpoints. And every checkpoint like that, somebody signs off that you applied some quality gate, and that quality gets reaches all the way to the right to your release, which is the bottle. And you know that the water in this bottle 
are the same raw water that you started with uh, on the left side. So we have a full trust, full visibility uh, to this uh, supply chain. And we want to have uh, the same thing in software. So this is a, the slide that lights up the audience for me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a lot of white. Uh, this is a 2011 uh, view from a book uh, called Agile ALM. And what it shows, it shows how you have different control points and or quality gates. Um, it actually speaks about taking your release, and so this is really a release first approach back in 2011, taking your release and promoting it between different repositories in Artifactory, wherever repository uh, signifies a, a target environment like uh, development and system testing and production meal, I don't think anyone calls it like that today, more staging and uh, production. And uh, this is very common. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are running systems that apply to this pattern? Okay, so, so quite a few. It's a, it's a very common pattern. But this pattern is, uh, I will show you, it's actually, actually lacking some, uh, some important uh, key points in it. It's very pragmatic, but uh, it has some uh, issues. So if we try to abstract this uh, release first, uh, first approach, we have uh, a source environment. And then we do some quality check on the release. And after we can promote it to the target, target environment if we're happy with, with the results. But the question that rises is, how do we make sure that we have, I mean, it's there, but it's not visible. It's coded somewhere, but you cannot see this process anywhere. It's just hidden somewhere in a workflow that somebody that created your uh, CI CD process uh, wrote. The other thing is about trust. How do you know, if you go back in time, that the quality check that you applied on the checkpoint was not tampered with, that it's really, it can be really trusted uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in a past view? And finally, integrity. How do you know that what you end up on the right side is the exact same release that you have on the left side? And what we're going to show you today is how we fix it for you. And it's very simple. What we're adding is we're taking the same process, we're doing the quality check, so we're analyzing the state of the release, and then we're doing some validation. We have a rule, for example, that all your test coverage uh, are beyond 80% or something like that. And then we sign it off with an evidence that we attach to this quality check and we deploy it to Artifactory with the release itself. So we'll get into more details uh, now and also in the next session where we'll actually demo it and what it looks like in, in the Jeff4 platform. Um, but really when you think about this approach, and this is something we call the seven-step approach. It uh, um, it's pretty much applies to every software release. There may be more or fewer steps, but uh, in general it kind of captures the, the full software release. So you have the curate phase where you select your materials or components, and then you're doing the creation, you code, you build the application. You have uh, the package phase, where this is the first time that you have a release, and then you promote it uh, across different quality gates. Finally, you distribute it, uh, and next you distribute it closer to, to the runtime. And then uh, you deploy it, and finally you run it, you operate it. So this applies everywhere, and you can take those three steps of uh, analyze and, vali and validate and sign. There's a bit of a delay. And you can apply it across each and every step. I'm not going to go uh, on uh, every box here, so don't worry. But uh, if we take the promotion, for instance, uh, so let let's get a, a very practical example. In the analyze phase you, phase, you may be doing a, a security scan to check there are no vulnerabilities. And then in, the, in your validation, you have a policy that says, if I have criticals, no go, I cannot promote it. And, but if everything is good, or even if everything is bad, I can capture this as an evidence and sign it and put it into Artifactory after I do the promotion or after I fail the promotion. And the way you can think about it is you can think about a release. So this is the release first trust approach. Moving all the way from the left, from dev, all the way to, 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 uh, to the runtime. Leaving behind a trail of evidence that you can attach to it. And those evidence, 
they cannot be repudiated and they can be fully trusted and they cannot be modified because they are signed. And this provides you the full compliance, the full visibility that you need to have uh, about your release in one single place. The practical way that we did it is we took a concept that many of you uh, are using today, which is the release bundle. This is the way of JFOC to speak about an application, really signed bundles or files. And we added the mechanism to attach signed evidence on top of this release. And uh, we will see it in the next session, exactly how it works and, and share with you all the details. So this was DevOps. So I'm moving on to security. DevSecOps. Okay. So taking this uh, seven-step approach uh, further, the issue with security is that your developers are being attacked. They, are, they became the target. They are the, the most easy, easiest target to attack. And in the security session, we will actually uh, uh, look at every step like that and the type of threats, the type of uh, uh, maliciousness that uh, developers, that attackers are trying to uh, apply there. And they have two goals. The first one is to inject themselves into your supply chain and then they can take uh, uh, over resources there. Uh, or worst, end up in your release. And we all know about uh, examples where this happened. This is like the worst thing that, that can happen because uh, they end up attacking your own customers. And the role of JFOC is to protect you all the way end to end at every point because we, have, we allow you to have this control at every step of the release. This is what we have today. Okay, We have X-Ray and advanced security, which are doing uh, uh, software composition analysis that you can run on your binaries. But also, um, on, uh, in, in, also in the IDE, we allow you to run the same scanner. Some of them are very, very advanced. They can detect a uh, secret or detect uh, the applicability of a certain CV. And we allow you to run them in your IDE, in your Git, and of course, on, on binaries. But we're actually shifting more to the left right now. And we're going to cover the curate phase, and we're going to cover the create phase. Uh, so let's speak about the curate phase. So the curate phase is where you pick the components that are going to end up with your release. So uh, again, I'm, I'm comparing this to uh, the traditional industry. Uh, and you have this notion of quality control compared to quality assurance. So quality assurance is where you already have your pipeline and you have some checks to see that the, the product is, is okay and uh, it matches what you expect. But really quality control is saying, there are some things that I never want into my pipeline. There are some goods that are never going to enter the production line ever. And uh, if I have some sour apples in my, uh, in my pipeline, I will eradicate them completely. And we are speaking here about package curation. It's about blocking unwanted, unwanted software components from the get-go, before they even enter your software supply chain. So we, we fix it before it, it's even broken. And the, the, the nice thing about it, and, and this is of course coming uh, uh, from your demand uh, many times, is that it gives you a very practical approach to security. Because you may not even know what you want to do, but there are some ground rules in the organization that say, no go, this is not getting into my release ever. Malicious package? No, never. I'm not, I'm not going to ever want to see it as part of my pipeline. And in the rare situation that I, that I will, I will give a waiver. But in a general way, I want to apply this uh, blockage uh, in the entry point. And yes, sometimes I will let components in that will become malicious, that will become bad, that will become sour, and then X-ray and advanced security will find them. But it's a lot cheaper and a lot, it's, a, it's a lot faster to fix them on the left. So this is package curation. We are going to show you all the details and the announcements, uh, the product announcements in the security session. So this covers the QA phase. And the next thing that we're going to add is we're going to add source code scanning or SAST. And I'm not going to, I don't have time to uh, cover that in this session, but uh, I can promise you that we will show you the differentiate, differentiated JFOG approach for source code scanning, which is always about giving you the best quality, not necessarily more, the, the, the largest amount of findings. So that's around SAST. 
And we're also going to move to the right, not in this event, but stay tuned. It's very soon. Okay, so moving on with uh, shifting left. And what we're doing, and uh, I will show you a short demo in a second, we're shifting left or the left. Uh, so, so what I mean by that is that we're protecting the desktop, we're protecting the workspace of your developers. So when you think about it, and this is something that we see many of you struggling with, I mean, you have everything figured out in your pipeline, but you ask us, okay, how do I make sure that my developers are also connected to Jeffog as a single source of, of proof for uh, everything they do with software? And normally this means that uh, you want to have the Jeffog CLI installed, you have to uh, get your uh, software uh, SDKs and software tools from from one place, uh, including your IDE, including the IDE plugins that you want your developers to use. You want your IDE to be connected to Jeffog to do the uh, uh, software curation, to do the security scanning, uh, to be configured to resolve for multifactory out of the box. And you also want the, the actual machine uh, package managers like uh, uh, the, the Python uh, package manager or, um, or Node or, or whatever to be configured to deploy and uh, resolve for multifactory, and that, that's an undertaking that, that is hard to do. A new trend that we're seeing in the market is, and again, we're seeing a lot of interest uh, by you today, uh, especially in the last year around this trend, is the world of uh, cloud development or environments or CDEs. You can see there are uh, many players in this domain, like Replit and Strong and uh, GitHub uh, code spaces. Um, and so on. And the idea behind, the, behind those plans is that uh, initially they were around, similar to DevOps, they were, they were around speed, they were around efficiency, you can get a very strong machine, click of a button, it's consistent between all your, your developer teams, uh, but it starts to shift towards security and compliance. Because once you provision your development environment to your developers, First of all, it's in the cloud, you don't, they don't take anything home, but it's also safe and consistent, and you can make sure that they are connected to the Jeffrey platform uh, from the get-go. So we started to uh, work with several partners uh, around this uh, uh, approach, and meaning that we integrate the Jeffrey platform out of the box uh, uh, to these tools. And I want to show you one of the first partners that we worked with, uh, which is Coder. I'm, I'm going to show you a demo. And this initial effort is actually formalizing the SDK that we're going to release to other partners, uh, which is providing the same uh, capability out of the box. So let's move on to see and uh, show demo. Okay. Cool. So uh, this is the UI of Coder. And I have, uh, in this case, I have two templates here uh, for development environment, and I'm going to launch a workspace. Okay. That's, that, that's the kind of issue I would like to have, because it means that <laughs> it's not a software bug, so I'm going to attempt the public internet here and hope for the best. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so we have our own private one. I hope this works. Okay, cool. So yeah, it even remembered what I tried to do. So let's get a workspace, call it Swamp Up Demo. Let's support a little bit, create the workspace. So what it's going to do now, it's going to provision a full de development environment in the cloud, connected to Jeffrog. It's actually using the CLI as the, as the one that is doing most of the heavy lifting, getting a one-time token uh, for multifactory, meaning that there is a token baked into develop this development environment that is not good anywhere else. And, um, and I'll just, uh, I'm just going to let it finish. I can fire up a local uh, VS Code that will be connected to this environment, but in this case, I'm going to fire a, a cloud version of a, a VS Code, a code server, and I should have my uh, small JavaScript project here, node project, um, and it's already connected to Jeffrog, so you can see this uh, start extra scanning. I have this uh, old express uh, dependency here. I'm going to start scanning. I had to do nothing. It's already connected. It's going to reach out to, um, 
to the JFOG platform, and oops, I see that uh, I have some high uh, uh, vulnerability here. Let's go to the JFOG tab. So open the package JSON. So Express itself is actually medium, but uh, anywhere, if I click here, I see that uh, we always highlight expect, uh, uh, Express, these are uh, transient dependencies. Um, and I can even watch the CVEs, and it's going to give me the explanation of how I should handle those CVEs and what they're about. This is coming again from JFOG. Um, and I know that uh, the latest Express is 182, one, uh, uh, sorry, 418. So let's try an update. Save it and let's do an npm install to force it. So it's going to update the dependencies. And if you have a shell file, I'm sure you saw that it's getting it from JFO, but uh, you don't have to. <laughs> so I'll show you npm uh, config. Get registry. And this is the JFOG URL right here. Okay, so now I can rescan. And my developer, or myself in this case, uh, yeah, your project was scanned. We didn't find any security issues. So we're all good. We can close this. And uh, this is how easy it is. And I actually have another workspace here. So let's go. System. Uh, Swamp up demo old. Let's, uh, let's look at it for a second. And I can see that in this case, uh, the, JFOG, uh, the JFOG scanned the actual development environment. It scanned the actual desktop. And I can see that the Docker uh, uh, that was used to uh, fire up this desktop, by itself, it's vulnerable. So it has six critical. And I have a, a development environment which is not safe to use. I can even go to JFOG. Hopefully, I'm logged in. Yeah, and I can see the, the actual vulnerabilities that are part of my development environment. So, so guys, this is how easy it is to get the JFOG environment uh, out of the box, uh, pre-configured, and also get uh, information of the security, not just of your pod, about your project, but uh, about the actual environment. So can we switch back to the presentation? Thank you. So this was about uh, shifting even uh, more to the left. Yes, we saw. Okay, we reached the, the point of no return. We have to speak about MLOps. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's start. So this prediction is uh, is really shocking. Uh, I never saw a prediction with 90% ever. 90% of your applications are going to use machine learning. This is huge. Like, this is unheard of. And when you think about it, I'm sure you're kind of not surprised. You're seeing the whole investment made by the cloud investors and the cloud providers. And you're seeing uh, companies that are, you're seeing open source models that are being released uh, uh, thousands a week. Uh, this is not even versions, but new, new type of models. Uh, but really what we will also show you in, in the demo, just to get uh, your appetite, is that it, the barrier for your developers to embed machine learning is almost zero. It's so easy, just so easy to, to put machine learning. Your, and your developers are very creative. So if they haven't come to you, they will come to you and they will tell you, please enable us with machine learning. We, we, we need that uh, in our applications. There's a lot of things that we, that we want to add uh, to our applications. We're seeing the same personally in Jeffo. Uh, but there is a gap, and this gap reminds me a lot of the early DevOps days where the, the, the technology was there, but the practices were not. And when you look at the normal machine learning flow, so normally it starts with collecting the data, so this is the data ops, and then you're doing some cleanup and transformation, and you create feature sets, which is, uh, is about uh, this is how you're going to train your model, and you store them, and you version them, and then you move on to the phase where you're actually creating the model, you're training it, you're going to have need probably some strong machines with GPUs, um, then you're doing the validation, and once you're happy, you create a model. Normally, it's not just one file, I'll show you in a second. 
um, and you version it and you store it somewhere so that you can actually deploy it and serve it, which is the runtime uh, ops phase. Uh, so you distribute it, you deploy it, you serve it, which is the run phase, and then you monitor, you get back the results, and if your predictions are not what you thought they are, or maybe they deteriorated over time, you're going to have to recreate the model and, and uh, repeat the, the whole process again. But the guys that are doing all of that, these are the data scientists, these are the Python programmers. They don't necessarily have the skills, and well, they need, like the blue rectangles there, the blue boxes, or well, they need DevOps. They cannot do it by themselves. They need the tools, they need the platform engineering that, comes, uh, uh, that needs to come behind uh, for responsible machine learning management. And the green one is where Jeff Fogg uh, has a very strong play, even today, and uh, mainly around management of the model itself. Okay. And this model is, is never alone. It's not just one file. And you can see that one of the screens is flickering, so it's true. It's not just one file. It's, no, it's, I call it model plus plus. Why plus plus? Because it's incomplete, really incomplete, without a set of files that are part of the quality of your model. It's the training data that you use to create the model. It's the feature sets that you created in order to have the clean data set for training. It's your training dependencies. If you're, uh, if you're developing a model, 99% you're, you're going to use Python. There are Python dependencies that you need in order to create the model. It's the hyperparameters of the model. It's the runtime dependencies of the model. Sometimes it's not the same Python libraries or not the same binaries that you're going to have to apply to this model in order to run it. And most of the time, you also need a container. Like the, the model by itself, it cannot run. You need to give it some kind of a rest endpoint and put a container uh, together with it. So this makes a bundle of an application. And finally, there's the output that comes out of your model. There's a lot of data to manage around that. It's all binaries. So this is, this is like natural. You have to manage those binaries in a single place. And what we're going to show you today is how we enable trusted and secure machine learning models. We are applying the DevSecOps and DevOps practices to MLOps. And we are adding a flow which is opinionated uh, around managing models in a secure way. And to do that, we are doing a couple of things. And again, in the next session, we will actually show you uh, how we do it. And we show you a demo and show the, the, the details with you. Uh, but first of all, it's around hosting, it's about model versioning, it's about sharing the model between different teams in the organization. It's about release bundling the model with all those dependent files that are part of the quality of your model, and sometimes your model, well, some of these files, your model is unusable without them. And finally, it's providing this model traceability around how you created the model. Then there's the remote model hosting. Many foundation models are being used today from platforms like Hugging Fest, your developers want to bring them in so they, they cannot be mutated, you cannot depend on the latest version, you may get totally different predictions if you get an, an, an unpredictable update, but also these are huge files. The Facebook Llama model, for instance, the basic one is 10 gigs, you don't want your developers to be pulling them from the internet every time. And finally, it's about model scanning. Scanning for compliance, for licensing issues, but also scanning for security. And in the security session, we will share with you uh, our research team findings about what's happening really in this field. Like it's a race and the attackers are also looking actively into this field to attack your developers. Then the last thing you want to have is you want integration out of the box with all the popular frameworks, Hugging Fest Transformers, and MLflow, and SageMaker, and Jupyter Notebook, and Langchain, and all those um, very popular frameworks that your developers will be using. So we have that all that in pipe for you. Basically, we are showing you today how we take the Jeffrey platform, expand it to the left, expand it to machine learning, expanding to more trust in your releases, and giving you an end-to-end -end secure software to supply uh, uh, platform. And with that, I want to invite to the stage, let's go straight into the DevOps uh, uh, announcements. I want to invite to the stage Yossi Shaul and Gali Zisman from the Artifactory team. Take it away, guys. Thank you. Thank you.
We are going to present and demonstrate some of the new and exciting capabilities uh, that we developed and you have mentioned uh, just uh, shortly before us. So let's get started and I want to start by describing you the journey that we took in order to support your development teams with your software development lifecycle. So, Artifactory, from the very beginning, supported the notion of isolated artifacts that are stored in isolated repositories. Those repositories could represent different teams, different technologies, and different maturity levels of those artifacts. Also, from the very beginning, we supported the notion of promotion, allowing you to take a bunch of artifacts and promoting them from one repository to another using the UI and using the REST API for automation. We then introduced the build info. The build info is an ESMO, software bill of materials, that describes your build, including the build artifacts and the build dependencies. It is created during the build, usually by a CI system, and with JFOG integrations and JFOG CLI, we collect all of this information and ship it into Artifactory together with the build artifacts. Now, with the introduction of the build info, we took the notion of promotion and managing your software supply chain to a higher level. You could now take an entire build and promote it through the different stages of your supply chain. We also introduced release bundles, which you have mentioned also with the introduction of JFOG distribution. Now, a release bundle is also an ESMO that describes your software releases. It is usually created later in the software supply chain, when you have a release that is ready to be shipped to other artifactory or artifactory agents. And along the way, we also integrated all of those phases and all of those elements with X-ray scanning capabilities to detect, mostly to detect software vulnerabilities and open source licenses. Now, this combination of uh, tools, uh, isolation of artifacts, promotion, building for release bundle, distribution, everything scanned by X-ray is very, very powerful. And we've seen many of our users, lots of them are here in the audience, taking those tools and using them extensively. But as you have mentioned at the beginning, it was not enough. It was still quite hard, and you had to work hard to build it yourself, to connect all of those dots, and some of the things are not easy to do. How do you know and you make sure that your release went through all of the phases that you define as mandatory for this process? How can you track it back all the way to the CI server, to the factory, to the version control system. It was not easy, and we heard it from many of our customers. So we took the challenge, and we gathered everything that we learned along the years, all of our experience, all of the information that we collected from our users, from our customers, from our partners, and we came up with a solution we came up with an opinionated solution, which is flexible and gives you some of the important elements that you need in your software supply chain. So, something that is simple to understand and simple to use, something that gives you visibility through all of this process to know exactly which phases your releases and your software supply chain went through, allow you to govern it by inserting mandatory quality gates and quality checks, 
And finally, providing you with a trusted system of record, a platform where, where you can keep all of this information immutable, signed, and secure. So I'm proud to announce today what we call the Release Lifecycle Management. And, and I'm going to demonstrate and show you how we connected all of those thoughts together. But before I do that, I want Gali to tell us everything that uh, she can about the building blocks of our solution. So, thank you, Yossi. Before I start, I want to introduce myself. My name is Gali, and I'm VP Product for Artifactory. I joined JFrog about a year ago, and since then, I learned two very important lessons. First is how important are our customers to us. We listen to your pain, your problems, and all the solutions that we're going to show here on the stage are driven by it. We want to solve your problems and your pains. And second is how seriously we are taking Swamp Up. This means that everything that we're going to demonstrate up here on this stage is already available to you. It means that you can take it back, you can take it, uh, integrate it back to your processes and start benefiting it from it starting today. So without further ado, I'm going to jump in and talk about the different building blocks that comprise our new solution. First is the release bundle. As you know, today when you release a software into production, it's typically comprised of multiple elements. You have your artifacts, your packages, your microservices, your models, and many more. However, you don't have a single place when you can see all the content of your release. You don't have a single object that's describing it. And that's exactly what we had in mind when we took the release bundle that was already existing, but very close to the production, to the distribution phase, and we pulled it all the way to the left. We did it to enable you to do what we call the release first state of mind. We wanted your developers to be able to create a release bundle as soon as possible in the release process. So we gave them a set, a set of very flexible tools to do that. You can create a release bundle out of your build info using the CLI, using AQL, and even create a composite release bundle of release bundles. Once it's created, the release bundle is essentially a signed SBOM of all the different elements of your release. It's tied together with all the metadata that is describing it. Once created, it becomes immutable, which means that you can no longer change it, but you can only aggregate more and more metadata to it. Once also, that also gives you the opportunity to promote it and distribute it as a single unit. The next building block, the next building block is environment. As you know, your software supply chain is comprised of multiple stages. In many cases, you will describe those stages based on the environments to which your software has been deployed to. We took that concept and implemented it. So our environment is essentially a set of repositories coming from multiple technologies, aggregated together, and now you can give them a significant name. By doing it, you can also get many benefits. You can now create different policies for your different environments. For example, you can decide that your development environment, you want to keep it relatively loose. You want to allow all your developers to upload and download content and modify it and play with it as much as they want to. However, you want to keep your production environment much more strict. There you want to only allow the admins to play with the content and modify it. On top of that, because we gave it a meaningful name and created this logical view of your supply chain, now you can have visibility into how many releases are actually existing in each of every environment. You can also track how long it took for your releases to move from one environment to the next. And just imagine what doors this opens in order to track your uh, R&D efficiency and productivity. It also allows you to simplify your workflow and create automations around it. Next is evidence. Evidence is a totally new concept of JFrog platform. So we talked about the release, we talked about the stages. 
But as the release moves from one stage to the other, it leaves behind a trail of documents. These documents could be your uh, source coverage scans, it could be your security scans, it could be approval gates, and it's also all the different operation and actions that your developers and the team took on your release. The evidence were designed to tell the entire story of your release, starting from the development all the way to the production. So once it reached the latest stages, you can look into it and see exactly what happened to your release in every state. Today, we are supporting internal evidence, which means that we are tracking all the internal operations that happen within the JFRO platform. Moving forward, we will also allow you to deposit external evidence and connect the different documents to the release. The next step is the promotion. Promotion is not an entity, it's actually an action, but that's the thing that ties it all together. Promotion is actually the action of taking one release and moving it from one stage to the other, from one set of repositories to another set of repositories. The promotion, as I said, leaves behind uh, an internal evidence that you can later track and you can create any business logic decision based on that. On top of that, the promotion itself gives you a, a place to put your uh, approval gates and decide on whether or not you want to allow the promotion to happen based on your criteria. Last but not least is distribution. Distribution is not that different from promotion, but it's intended to cover the last mile. Once your release is uh, ready to be shipped, you can use the distribution to distribute it from one artifactory to another, or from one artifactory edge to another artifactory from one artifactory to the artifactory edge. Similar to promotion, this creates an internal evidence that you can later track and also allows you to set approval gates. So I hope everything that you heard right now got you very excited, and I'm going to move it back to Yossi to demonstrate to you how it's going to look in production. All right. Thank you, Gali. Uh, so uh, I want to spend one more minute before I'm starting the demonstration to explain what I'm going to, to demonstrate. So we have uh, in the setup environment, we have an artifactory central server sitting in San Francisco, and this server is connected to X-Ray and JFOG distribution, with JFOG distribution connected to two edge nodes in London and in New York. Our simulation, of the demo starts with the build process. I'm not going to show it, but we simulated the build process that creates a sample application. It takes the sample application together with the build info that I mentioned earlier, taking it and deploying it to one of the environments that we created, the dev environments. The sample application is composed of three different technologies and each one of the artifacts is going to a different repository based on its type. So we have three environments over here, dev, QA, and pod. Simple yet realistic example of a release pipeline. So we are going to start with the dev environment. I'm going to create a release bundle out of a build info. This is one of the ways, uh, probably uh, a popular way of creating a release bundle. And then I'm going to promote it to the QA environment, going through one of the mandatory gates that we define with X-ray, so X-ray is going to scan it, produce an evidence that it happened, and then moving the artifacts, copying the artifacts, the release artifacts, and changing the state of the release bundle to the QA environment. Once we are happy, we are going to do it to the prod environment, and from there, when we are ready to distribute it to the different edge nodes, we are going to use Jeff distribution to do just that. Okay, so let's start the actual demo. So a quick look at the environment again. So we have the topology over here with San Francisco, the main server, New York, London, two of the edges. And we also configured three different environments, each one with its own set of repositories. So as I mentioned, we are going to start from a build. So we simulated several builds. In this case, I'm going to start with a build that was scanned by X-ray, and X-ray found a critical vulnerability. But for the sake of the demo, we are going to start with that. So drilling down to the build, 
that's the build info with the components that we that we have in the sample application and I'm going to use the UI to create it. Of course, everything that I demonstrate is also available and probably with, with more options through the REST API, but it's a good way to demonstrate through the UI. So I'm going to create a release bundle. Every release bundle has a unique name, a unique version. I'm going to give it a version, 101. So based on the build info, we automatically detected which components, which artifacts it contains, also the dependencies, which are optional, and not going to include them here. Okay, I created a release bundle. Let's drill into it. So that's the one I just created. So the first page that we see here is the action tracking. This is where we can see everything that happened with the release bundle and all the evidence that we collect through the software supply chain, through the stages that the release bundle went through. At, at the moment, only one action, I just created it. We can also have a quick look at the, at the content, the packages, the artifacts, which types they are. And as mentioned, it's, a, it's an S form. It's a JSON file that we signed and we keep immutable. So our next stage is trying to promote it to the QA environment. So again, doing it from the UI, hitting promote. We have a signing key already uh, performed for this, for this action. And I'm going to select the target uh, environment, which is the QA. Hitting next. Now we automatically detected all the technologies, the different technologies that you, we are using, the different package types. And based on the target environments and the technologies, we also automatically selected the matching artifact the matching repositories, okay? In this case, we set it up exactly as we'd like, but in other cases, you may choose different set of repositories. You can also configure it via REST API, but here we are happy with the automatic selection, and I'm going to attempt a promotion to the QA environment, and it failed. Not surprisingly, this is exactly how we set it up. Mind, reminding you that the build we started with has a critical vulnerability. Uh, in this case, it was found before we created the release bundle, but in other cases, we might have created the release bundle from a uh, build info which was definitely okay when we started, but a vulnerability might have happened afterwards. So if we want to look at the details, I'm opening the message here, and we can see that X-ray blocked it. I'm going to open it in a new tab. Having a quick look at what's wrong with the release. So we have here a uh, scan results of X-ray, something similar to what you have showed you about uh, scanning the uh, developer environment. Hitting one of the uh, CVEs, we can see the different information about it from, uh, from X-ray, including which components is affected, what is the current version, and how to fix it. You also have lots of other information, uh, either from public sources or from uh, the JFOG research team, uh, very extensive and informative information. So in the real world, we would take this and, and figure out how to fix it. In this case, we will just, it's the log4j. We are going to, to, to upgrade it to the new version. So assume that we did that with the new build. Now, before moving on to show you the next build, I just want to show you the, the artifact itself. When, when we tried to promote the release to the new environment and it was blocked, it didn't pass the quality gate, nothing happened. Okay? So we didn't copy, we didn't move any artifact, we just recorded an evidence that it failed. So if we look at the repositories of the QI, we can see that they are empty. Okay, going back to the build, so we have a new build with an upgraded version of uh, log4j. I'm going to do this a little bit more quickly. So, new version for the new release, same content. And we have the new version over here. Going to promote it again to the QA environment. Let's do that.
Perfect. This time it was successful. And again, as our software supply chain processes continue, let's say we tested it, we added uh, additional checks, and we are happy and we want to move it to the next stage again, just hitting promote or automating it. I'm going to move it to production. Um, we now detected it's a new target environment, and we detected a new set of repositories, now promoting it to the production repositories that we configured for this end. Let's do that. Perfect. Successful again. And if we have a quick look now at the artifacts tree, we can see that we have the dev environments and we also have those artifacts promoted, the, the specific version promoted to the uh, QA environment and also to the production environment. Great. Now, the last step in this demo is to take all of this, once we are ready again, and using distribution to distribute it to two of the edge nodes that we have. Again, let's do it from the UI. I'm selecting the two edge nodes that we want to promote to, and we also want to automatically create those repositories in the target if they are missing. Okay, it's going to take a few more seconds. Perfect. Success, successful. So, and what we see here is a trail of what happened with this release. Again, again, a very simple one, but, uh, but uh, conclusive. And everything here is kept as an evidence behind the scene, something that you cannot change, you cannot modify, and you can use to prove and make sure that your release went through the stages you, uh, you wanted to go through. Again, if we, uh, some of the evidence provide more details, so in this case the distribution one, I can open it, I can see what, what happened, I saw, I can see that it went through uh, two of the different edge nodes. No need to see it now. Okay, back to the slides. So I hope that uh, you, you managed to um, see how we connected everything together with, with a simple demonstration of those capabilities. And as we continue our journey, continue our journey towards extending those capabilities and adding more, um, open, joining more personas to those uh, capabilities, I want you to start imagine what you can already do with the thing that I showed you for the different roles, different responsibilities in your team. For instance, uh, dev managers and, and managers in general who can define quality gates through this process. Uh, the CISO who can also participate in those processes, defining security gates and enforcing them and seeing dashboards of those things. The compliance manager who can take this information and generate reports showing which phases the release went through. And this is not all. There are many others not mentioned here that can benefit from those possibilities, not just the traditional roles that we are working with. Now, there are some few more that are not mentioned here explicitly, but were mentioned earlier. Those are the data scientists, the AI practitioners, the MLOps engineers, and I want Gali now to tell us what we have for them. Thank you. So, we've been on the stage for about 20, 30 minutes and we didn't mention MLOps, develop, uh, data scientist, or any of that. And that, of course, is unheard of. <laughs> so, if you look behind me, you can see that the AI and ML world is currently exploding. Everybody is talking about AI and ML, everybody is doing it, everybody is playing with it, and so do your developers. Whether you like it or not, they are already bringing the models into your organization. When we looked at it, we realized that the state of the AI and ML uh, market today is not that different from the software and open source uh, software market about 10 to 15 years ago. And the challenges are the same. So, we thought about it and we said we are the best company to solve those challenges. We already solved the SDLC uh, and the binaries challenges for you. We want you today to start realizing that you need to bring your ML models and bring them into your 
uh, SDLC. Many of you in the audience are already our customers. That means that you're already trusting us to solve all your binaries challenges for you. What we want to uh, empower to you today is to bring your ML model into your SSDLC and treat them similar to any other binaries that you have within your organization. We are already giving you binary 360, meaning that we're giving you all the tools and the capabilities that you need to manage those binaries. As I said, the ML models are not different. They're just another set of binaries. Next in, is universality. As you all know, Artifactory is probably the most universal package manager out there. We make a promise many years ago to support any kind of binaries that it out there. And today we want to keep that promise to you and include this new set of binaries into our solution. Last but not least is the scalability. The model files are huge. They are gigabytes in size. Only Artifactory is the only platform that can support this kind of scale and allow your developers and your data scientists to uh, consume this model in the best way. So without further ado, I'm happy and excited to announce our native support for uh, remote and local repositories over having things. So let's talk a little bit about the details of our solution. So, first thing that we're giving you is the option to create remote repositories over Hugging Face. Hugging Face is an open hub uh, where you can very simply go to and fetch models to. However, that also means that you have the same risk that you have with the software, with your open source software. It means that you are at risk of the models tomorrow disappearing on you, changing on you, modifying, or anything like that. We want you to solve that through the remote repository by allowing Artifactory to proxy and cache those models for you and protect you against all these changes. Second is the X-ray scans. So even today, X-ray is able to scan the models, find any licensing violation, making sure that the licensing uh, is in compliance with your regulation and how you want to control them within your organization. On top of that, X-ray is also able to scan the models and look for malicious code. And our friend from security, Eyal and Asaf, will talk about it in the next uh, talk. Last but not least is the local uh, repositories that you can create to host what you have called Model++, plus plus, meaning the model together with all the artifacts that are related to it. You can host there the, uh, all the intermediate uh, elements that you created along the process. You also can create and host there the data sets, and everything that you need and make it accessible for your developers to start using and moving around the organization. On top of that, now you can take it, promote it, distribute it, and make sure that you are able to deploy it in a secure way to the runtime. So, I'm going to